Hey, welcome to Our Defining Moments. I'm your host, Mary McClements. In this podcast, I talk with people about the split second moments in their lives that sent them in directions that they never expected. From the woods of Vermont to the streets of San Francisco to the Camino de Santiago in Spain, you may be astonished by the chain reactions these moments have had not only for my guests, but for those around them. My guest today is Jan, and Jan is from the Netherlands, and he is a transformational life and business coach. I'm super psyched to have him here to tell his story, to paint a picture of what his life has been like since his defining moments and before. So Jan, welcome. Thank you very much, Mary. Great to be with you. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you're here. Yeah. It's always exciting for me to meet people and talk about their stories, but because you're so far away, it's even more special. So (laughs) (laughs) how are things in the Netherlands today? Today it's warm. I'm not sure what it is in Fahrenheit, but we're approaching the 30 Celsius again. Whoa. But it's also warm in the sense of what's going on here in the country. I think there's a lot of stuff happening politically at the moment, but also a lot of stuff with our uh, farmers who are mad about some of the political things that are happening. and potentially losing their farms, their jobs, their businesses, which I totally understand. But they take it to the streets these days. So they start blocking highways and everything. They start to put things on fire. So there's really heat going on here. And it's not, it's not always enjoyable, I can tell Figurative you. Figurative fire, not real fire. No real fire. Oh, I mean, wow, real fire. Too. I mean, we were just driving on the road the other day to go to a concert and they blocked the road with all kinds of pieces of their equipment. But they also brought some, some massive hay uh, structures and put that on the road and next to the road and started literally put things on fire. So the fire fire trucks had to be there and everything to put it out. The road wow. has been destroyed, needs to be replaced and everything. So it's a, it's a crazy world at the moment. In yeah. our country, which normally is so quiet and moderate and everything else around it. Yep. Right. <laughs> I, and I think of like the Netherlands and I want to ask you in a second where exactly you are in the Netherlands, but I always think of the Netherlands as, you know, cobblestone streets and little canals and lots of people on bikes and kids playing in the street. And I'm going to ask you about your childhood later, but where exactly are you in the Netherlands? I'm in one of our provinces called Drenthe, so I'm relatively close to the German border. So when you look at the map of the oh. Netherlands, I'm on the right hand side, okay. almost opposite, opposite of Amsterdam, but then close to the German border. Okay, thanks for that. Visuals are always really helpful. <laughs> so our defining moments. We had a little short conversation earlier and we talked a little bit about how we have them all the time, right? Yep. And it's a matter of noticing. It's a matter of reflecting. Some are bigger than others. Some make bigger changes. Before we get into the defining moment that you want to talk about, I would love for you to paint a picture of your childhood. So I grew up in Canada and the United States, which I'm guessing is very different than growing up where you did. And again, I picture cobblestone streets, a lot of people on bikes, kids playing kind of iconic European games in the streets. Like, I don't know, is can throwing? Can throwing? Is that a, is that a <laughs> game you played as a kid? I don't know. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. So I just would love for you to paint a picture of your childhood, please. Childhood. A father who was working a lot in an international company. Mom who likes spending time with us and, uh, and our dogs. I had a sister. And in the place where I live today, I'm actually living in my parents' house right now. So where I grew up. So we bought that house when my wife and I moved over here and we had our children here. But as I was growing up, I was considered, as they called it here, and it's an easy word to translate into English as well. I was called import because I wasn't born here. And interestingly Mm -hmm. enough, they would let you know that. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> so I arrived here, I think, as a three-year-old, three- or four-year-old. Everybody was like, you have to play football, soccer, so get into the team. But then, of course, in the team, it was, yeah, your import. Wow. And, of course, you, you get to be pushed out immediately. You're not part of it. You're not belonging, which is one of those big words, of course. You don't speak our language because I learned more like the general Dutch language and not their specific dialect, which they would tell me all the time. So that wasn't fun. And then if you're in school, primary school to begin with, and you're pretty smart, pretty outspoken, have ideas about the world, and most people don't really connect with that, it's quite easy to be 
to be or become or to act like, I mean, I'm not sure which one of it is, but that's, that goes back really deep, I guess, uh, like sort of an outcast. Yeah. And then there's not a whole lot of people that you actually connect with or resonate with. So when there is one that you get to know when you're four, who you really resonate with, that and starts to be, to play a really important part in your life as your best friend ever. And this is leading into what we talked about before the, uh, the defining moment. But if there's, if there's somebody where you really feel like, yeah, wow, that's the person I can, I can talk with. That's the person I can have fun with. It's just great to have that person. If everybody else is not that person. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. And I just want to make a comment on a couple things. I love talking with people, especially when I realize like, oh, I have a judgment. Because I like to think I'm pretty judgment free. I know everybody, mm-hmm. everybody has judgments, but in the United States, it's the people who have darker skin, who may have Mexican heritage, who are, even if they were four generations born in the United States, are still yeah. in many ways considered outcasts. And I look at you, yeah. you're a white male yeah. in Europe, and yeah. not realizing that that type of outcast you know, is a thing for somebody who's a white male. So I love that you just taught me something new and then I caught myself (laughs) in a judgment. I mean, it's not completely comparable, of course, to what's going on in the US because it's more like the institutionalized part. This is really one human being to another human being in a sense of, hey, you wear glasses or you are way too smart and I don't like that. So we're going to push you out basically or you're not born here. So we push you out. And it's not fun, but I can imagine that for the people in the US who are experiencing that from an institutional perspective as well. And just yeah. having to live with that day in, day out, even as adults. I mean, right. this is my childhood. As an adult, I grew over that. But even as adults, I mean, that's a completely different story. Yeah, absolutely. My Canadian blood to understand how the government can approve or not approve of your sexual orientation or who you marry or <laughs> anything. It just, I don't understand. Okay, so you mentioned feeling outcast, not being welcomed, and you meet another young boy who yep. sounds like you were really close with. Can you tell me about him? And how, how did you first meet? And was it like love at first sight? Or was it, oh, I'm just going to test the waters here because I've been poo-pooed so many times already? Here. No, I think in his case, and his name was Peter, we met, I think when we were four or something like that. Mm. So this was at school, somewhere in the playground, you start playing together. And before you know it, you really get to stink. You really get to feel like, hey, this is somebody to speak with. And we were starting to have a great time. He was born and raised there. His parents were born and raised there. He grew up originally on a farm. His father was a beekeeper. The door was always open. So yeah, we just connected. We just hit it up. Yeah, I love that. I'll just really quickly tell you my best friend I met when I was in third grade. And I was new to a school. She had been at the school and she was the tallest person in the class, or she thought she was going to be the tallest person in the class in third grade. The other tall person left and I come in, I come in and she sees me and I'm taller than her. And she like hated me. (laughs) And we became best friends and have been best friends ever since. So sometimes it's an oppositional thing that brings you two together. And sometimes it just flows and it sounds like it flowed for you and Peter and right. Yep. So you met it when you were four and you maintained a close relationship through your primary school years, through your teen years. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah, throughout life, I think on primary school, we both were part of a, a group of young people, really, I mean, eight or nine year olds. And every Saturday we would go to a specific area here, it's close to where we live to check out the birds' nests and everything and count the eggs and see if the birds were already hatching and stuff like that. So, I mean, just, I mean, the, the fun stuff that you do, I guess, when you're young and you live close to or close to nature. At a certain point, we, when we moved to the place where we, where we lived, the house we lived before, not this one, but the house we lived before, I literally lived about 50 meters away from his house and his parents' oh, house. So we fun. went to the same school and yeah. we lived in the same neighborhood. So we saw each other a lot. But then even when my parents bought the house I live in today, we were still, of course, in contact through school and we were just, we were best friends. We found out we had the same hobby or we developed the same hobby. I'm not even sure how that works. We both got into photography. So that was really interesting. So yeah, as I said, the doors were open. The afternoons after school, you just barge in and hey, what are we going to do today? And we had fun. That's awesome. I love that. I feel like it's very few people who actually 
meet their best friend when they're so young and they remain friends. Can you share a memory of Peter that like maybe something that you would only, I don't know if they do this in the Netherlands, but in the States and in Canada, when somebody gets married, the best man or the maid of honor, they get up and make a speech. And often it's in the speech, they're divulging some little secret about the person getting married. And I'm wondering if you have a memory about Peter that you would only share to kind of burn him at his wedding. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure if his kids will ever hear this, but I I mean, I'll just go with it. Okay. Peter always had an eye for girls and there was always, always some imperfection in a nice way. So it wasn't like, "Ah." I mean, there was, a tilt in the eye or something like that. Uh, or her just, one just eyebrow this, is too high. This little, just this little. And he always, he always found them and he always knew, but also say what the little thing was. Uh-huh. And do you have a specific example? <laughs> 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 if that's too much information, you don't have to share. Uh, no, well, there was one girl who, I think she was a little bit, well, cross-eyed is the big word, but, but there was definitely something with one of her eyes. That's which, what you called it when you were a kid, right? That's what we call it, exactly. Right. And no pun intended, by the way, I don't mean intend to harm anybody with it, but that's how we call it. I mean, it just one of her eyes was not facing in the same direction as the other, let's put it like that. And our language changes, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's one of the examples. Okay. So here's the big question of the day. We've talked a lot about Peter and I'd love for you to share what your defining moment is around Peter. Yep. For the defining moment, I have to take you back to May 1st. 2005, a beautiful day, beautiful weather. I woke up in the morning and was thinking like, wow, this is a beautiful day. And there were two things for me to do on the day. One thing was that I had met with him the day before and he was getting ready to open his own store. So he had been working in a photography store for many, many years. Oh, he kept uh, but he was photography. I love that. He kept it with photography. Yep. So I was, a, I was a regular client in, in the store that he worked in. But then he, at a certain point, he decided, hey, I was running my own business. He was feeling like, and that might be something for me as well. So he decided to run his own store. He found the perfect location for that. He started to do all of the, all of the work in front. What am I going to be putting in there? What am I selling back then? Of course, the mobile phones were just getting a hype and everything. So, hey, which one, which brands am I going to be putting in there next to uh, mm-hmm. the cameras and everything? What will the store look like? It needs to be repainted. So he was putting a lot of effort in, in that, in that time frame. And the store was supposed to be opened the week after May 1st. Okay. So the day before, the evening before we, I'd been at his place, we've been in his garden, drinking some beers. I think we even smoked a cigar, just what we did on a regular basis, just having fun, having those conversations. And at a certain point he said to me, well, tomorrow I'm going to be working on my store again. Uh, what are you doing? I said, well, in the afternoon I have to go to the airport because I need to fly to, uh, to Italy for a program. But if you want me, I can help you in the morning. I said, well, yeah, that's an idea, but we'll, we'll be in touch. We'll talk about that. Mm-hmm. So we didn't make... No solid plans. I offered help. He said, yep, I'll get back to you. Then the next morning I woke up and I was like, oh, a beautiful day. I mean, sunshine and everything. And, but I didn't remember that we talked about him either picking me up or doing something. And I was also like, well, I have to be at the airport at about three o'clock. So you know what? I just grab my stuff and make sure I'm ready for, for travel. So at a certain point, I get in my car and I start driving. And I think half an hour into my drive for about an hour and a half to Amsterdam to Schiphol Airport. And my phone rings and my wife on the phone and she said, are you driving? I said, yep. She said, well, you may want to put the car to the side because I need to tell you something. I was like, okay, well, you can tell me. I mean, hey, I can keep my eye on the road. And she mentioned that he had been in an accident. He somehow probably lost control of the steering wheel. He the car went off on the right-hand side of the road, and because he couldn't control it, he smacked into a tree on the left-hand side. Oh. But smacked into it so badly that he was immediately brought into hospital. She didn't know what was going on. Uh, as she called me, she was on the way to the hospital with his wife, and the only thing they knew is it's bad, but not mm-hmm. how bad. So I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, so what do I do? I'm in my car on my way to the airport. There's a program happening where I need to be. My best friend is in big trouble. But I didn't know how big it was. So let's wait and see. So I go to the airport. I check in and do everything. And I'm like, Jan, I mean, come on. No matter what happens, no matter how bad it is, there's only one place you need to be right now. And that's there. I mean, you don't want to be in the... I mean, the customer... Yes, interesting, important, but not today. Sorry, I'll email them. I'll go back home. So I went to the counter and I said to the, the ground crew, I said, listen, I know my luggage is checked in. I have to go home. This is the situation. 
yeah, but you can't leave because then we're going to be in trouble with your luggage. And I said, you know what? Figure it out. I'm going to go home. And if you can put my luggage somewhere, that's fine. If my luggage is going to be gone, it's going to be gone. Right. That should be the least of my worries right now. So I got back into my car and I drove back to the hospital. Wow. And then as I arrived, I saw my wife. I saw his wife. They sort of cut me up to speed about what was going on. He had massive internal injuries. Mm. They were working on him, as they called it, in the emergency room, but no clue what was going on and how long it would take. So as we were talking, as they filmed me and the door opens and they bring him out. Wow. And I look into his eyes and I think that's a defining moment for real. I mean, the whole thing is defining, but that was a real defining moment because I think that's the last time I saw him more or less conscious. That's the last time I looked him in his eyes mm. the way I was always able to look into his eyes. And then the tranquilizer, the hold all and everything kicked in and that was it. It took 10 weeks for him in the hospital. They tried everything, looked at a lot of things, but there was no consciousness anymore. So he was alive, but not conscious. And they told me yeah. that a certain part of his neck broke basically, yeah. which is the part where apparently our consciousness, as they called it back then, resides, or at least the communication between brain and body resides. So if he would survive and live, he would live like a vegetable. There would be nothing going on for him. And of oh. course, every time when you sit next to the bed and there's a grunt and you feel like, uh-huh, something oh. is happening. Right. A little hope. And the doctor and doctors are like, exactly, a little hope. And the doctors were like, nope, this is just a programmed reaction in the brain and this is what's happening. I was like, hey, no. Right. It can't be. There must be something. So I was actually, and this is crazy when I think about it right now, but I was trained in Reiki, so the energy management part. So I, at nice. a certain point, I was like, hey, you know what? There's nothing else I can do. So I can at least put my hands close to you. I don't even have to touch you and see if I can get the Reiki going. Yeah. But the moment I did that, there was this real deep, in the sense of, which I interpreted as, From him. don't do this. Oh, From him. Yeah. Wow. I mean, leave me. It won't make a difference probably or whatever was going on, but clearly don't. Yeah. That's the message I got from it. Wow. I can't put my finger on how that would feel to lose your best friend. And it sounds like you were so in tune with him. Yeah. And when they brought him out and you looked at him into his eyes and you felt like that was the last time that you really, he was there. What did you see? I think fear in his eyes, just the whole, what the heck is going on? Just not understanding it. One moment you're living or trying to live the dream. One moment you're getting ready for your own business. You're driving a car and the next moment you're in hospital and you, I think he, did, he didn't have any clue what happened. Jeez, and just uh, maybe a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is but just, just this big question mark in his eyes This big, what the heck is going on? Yeah. Right. And, what would you have preferred to have seen? <laughs> hey man, glad you're here and let's make sure I'm going to get out of this or something like that. Or yeah. wow, tough ride, but I'll, I'll manage or something like that. Of course, that's crazy when I say it like that, but that's of course what you hope. I mean, when you go to the hospital, you hope that there's a sign that says, hey, we can do something. Or at least when they bring him out of the ER and you start having the conversations with the doctors, which we had many together with his wife, what can be done and everything. And then when they tell you that nothing can be done, then the big conversation needs to happen in the sense of, okay, so what's next? Is next for him to go to any facility where they will take care of him as long as his heart is beating and as long as his body is willing to be taken care of for in the sense of make sure you get your fluids and make sure you get cleaned up and make sure you keep breathing? Or do we look for the more humane way and say, hey, if this has been it, then how do we make it as easy as possible for you, as human as possible for you to leave this earth. And the problem was that, which is, I guess, then the point for many people, A, the question, of course, is how do you look at this from a spiritual perspective? I mean, are you allowed to do this? Yes or no? And his wife was like, yeah, well, we need to do something. And I felt the same thing. But the problem is if you're in a hospital where they have a different view, then there is no active help. When you haven't made any documents that state this is how I want to be treated when that point comes, which in the Netherlands luckily is something you can do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people haven't done it. 
then when the moment arrives, the only thing you can do is as family, as then his wife decided yeah. to stop any treatment. But this is a guy, I mean, you were talking about the Dutch people before, uh, how tall they are. And yeah. he was tall and he was big and he was strong like an ox. And he had a heart that could go on for a long time, which basically meant that the day that his wife had to make the tough decision and say, hey, we have to let him go. It took him 10 days to go. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And were you having little spikes of hope along those 10 days? No, I think along those 10 days, it was accepted. What we did is every day we went there and we were, well, having, even though we couldn't hear us, but we were having, we had our conversations. We did what we had to do. His sons made drawings, which we brought the children. His children were very young at that point. So his wife was like, I'm not sure if it's good for them to see him like this and to have that memory. So we just, it evolved like it evolved. One of his older brothers stayed with him. The other one stayed with him. And then eventually, one of the mornings, I was sitting in my office at home, working outside. And my wife opened the office door and said, hey, I just got a conversation from Sylvia, who just told us that Peter has passed away. And that was on the one hand side, a big relief in the sense of, all right, now at least he has his peace. But then of course, the real missing starts because there had always been this little bit of hope. But yeah, yeah. also at the moment the doctor said, they explained what it was and how it was, then you know, there is no hope. Right. And I want to talk about that moment in a minute, but if I can loop back, thank you so much for sharing this. It's so difficult. Sometimes our defining moments are full of joy and sometimes <laughs> they're horribly traumatic. Yours is, if I could put it into a category, would be the latter. (laughs) So this defining moment has quite a few smaller defining moments in it. Maybe you two were going to go work together that morning. Maybe the two of you were going to get into a car together. I wasn't sure if he was driving (laughs) you to the airport. You got the call. You went to the airport. You checked in and then decided no. So when you got the call from your wife and she told you that Peter had been in this accident Mm -hmm. what kept you from turning around right then yeah i think first of all not knowing not knowing how big it had been for him or how how much trouble he had been in i knew it was bad but on the other side i was also running my own business which is a crazy moment in the sense of so what do you do yeah and this this is where of course when i arrived at the airport i was like man you must be crazy there's only one place you can be but in that split second that wasn't the the immediate thought i think that the shock at that moment when my wife told me it was so big and so many things started rambling mm-hmm. that I didn't even think about turning the car. I mean, I was, I was heading for the airport. So that was where I was heading. And in the meantime, my head was, and my heart was overflowing with all kinds of things. And the first thing that hit me was, I mean, clearly, as you said, that maybe you should have been in that car. And that's the main thing that hit me immediately. What if that morning I would have called him and said, Hey, we talked about this last night. I would help you. Will you pick me up? Mm-hmm. What if we both had been working there? Would we have left the place later and would nothing have happened? What if he would have said, hey, you know what? I'm tired. Can you drive us back? And I would have been driving. What if? And on and on and on and on. Yeah, you can so drive only, yourself bananas asking what if. And there's nothing and I did, you can do And I did. It. And I think that's one of the key things I learned with hindsight about defining moments. You can drive yourself bananas. Yeah. And I did drive myself bananas. I mean, grief is one thing and everything else that happens around it with the funeral and how do you arrange that and how do you make it okay. special? And we both enjoyed specific music and I think it was the first time at a, at a funeral where actually house music was played. Oh. We played a song by EDM song by Paul van Dyke, Time of Our Lives, which was interesting uh, mm. to see what happened there. But that whole what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. And that has been with me for a long, long, long time. I think that it actually only started to sort of release itself through conversations about two years ago. Yeah. Do you feel any regret or guilt around his death or, I don't know, what emotion? I, did. I mean, yeah, there's I, a lot of emotions. I, I did. But, I, yeah. Well, there's a whole lot. No, I did. I did for sure. The key thing I felt was guilt. And specifically because... That one big what if question, what if I would have been in that car with you and I would have been driving, would this have happened? 
but then also the other question came, which is more like relief almost, which sounds crazy, but that's the other spectrum or the other, the other end of the spectrum. I'm glad oh, I wasn't honey. in the car with you because maybe we both would have smacked into that car and what would have happened to my wife and my family? So it's, you're all over yeah. the place. Yeah. And it's a never ending rabbit hole. Have you been able to forgive yourself or let go of the what ifs or I don't even know if it's a matter of forgiving, but maybe it's a matter of letting go of the what ifs and the guilt you might have felt. Have you been able to move on from that? I think so. I think that based on many conversations, I mean, as you and I both talked about before, we're both part of Coachville and part of the Coachville programs is doing a lot of practicing. And as part of the practicing, you have many conversations and you start talking about pivotal moments. You start talking about things that you try to do and all of a sudden you do inner freedom and boom, this one activity or this one moment comes back. And this, Can this you one. Can describe inner freedom really quickly <laughs> as, a, as a practice in coaching? What inner freedom is like is all of us have... Moments in our life when we try to do something and it may not be going the way we expect it to go. And interestingly enough, when we become aware of those and start exploring them, there will be thoughts involved, there will be feelings involved, there will be often something going on in our body, physical sensations that we feel. And what inner freedom basically says is if you have one of those moments, let's talk about it, let's think about it, let's observe it, let's zoom in on it, let's pause it, let's freeze it, whatever you want to call it, and go deep and try to figure out what is the moment in your life which most of the time subconsciously is connected with it Mm -hmm. and based on the subconscious connection it is blocking your energy it is stopping you from doing what you would like to do it's stopping you from living your life yeah that was a fantastic description thank you (laughs) thank you just for those who you know have no idea which is probably most people what inner freedom is the only thing i'll add is you did say this but recognizing the physical sensations in your body yep. and really connect. Yep. It's the mind, mind, body kind of more connection. So meta connection or the embodiment connection, whatever you want to call it. But I think that is the key thing. And I think what, what's most important here, Mary, is that we all have those things. And that's the crazy part. And most people don't even know that they try to do something or they want to reach out to someone or they want to tell somebody they love them or whatever it is, and they're not doing it. And Mm. and quite often there's this blocker in the subconsciousness and they have no clue that it's there. You know, only when you say, hey, but why is this difficult? Why is this hard? Let's explore. Let's be curious. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Let's try, as we talked about before, not to judge and see what it is and see what pops up and see if that somehow brings relief or releases the energy. Yeah, yeah, so good. And I can attest that I've done it quite a few times and I've done it with my clients quite a few times and it's always very helpful. So I want to ask you a question that may seem kind of strange, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What did Peter's death do for you? <laughs> well, this is part of the, the conversation we had just before. The what ifs were a part of it and you, you basically learn that you will never get the answer. I mean, this whole speculation doesn't make a lot of sense. I think what we all try to do is understand why that happened. Okay, why this yeah. guy who was living a great life, had a great family, finally chose to do his own why out of everybody or why in general, why did it have to happen to him? And we don't find the answer. And I think that's what it did for me because I've been thinking a lot about that why only to understand that at the end of the day, in these defining moments, the world doesn't stop. The world doesn't pause. Everything continues. For you in that moment, life is like everything stops. And you even wonder, is there is a life after all of this? I mean, trauma isn't big enough. And how do I move on? And interestingly enough, we do. And I think that's what it did for me. The realization that things happen in our lives. And this is what I find interesting about all the discussion about defining moments. And either they define the rest of our lives. Or we look at them and say, all right, so how is this meaningful to me? How is this substantial to me? Or how is this having any significance to me? But the only person who can answer that is you. Yeah. You said something about, you know, the world keeps going on. Things just Mm -hmm. keep happening. And I dated a man years ago who, when we were together, his mother died. And six months, a year later... He said to me, you know, the hardest thing about 
her death. It's not just missing her. It's not wishing she were here. It's that everyone else has moved on. And I yep. think about it every day. Yeah. And I wonder how, if that rings true to you. No, it does. It does. It does. Yeah. It's and been then, um, 17 years. And so. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it's easy for me to remember because three months before he had his accident, my youngest son was born. Oh my gosh. Oh. So his, his sort of birthday, the year of his birth and the year of Peter's passing go hand in hand. But it's true. I think this is the interesting part about us as human beings. We all have these moments. We all either lost somebody or will lose people, right? We all have our fair or unfair share of trauma, trouble, turbulence, whatever you want to call it, tragedy and everything that's happening. And I think that when we all realize that is a part of life and the world doesn't stop and everybody mm-hmm. else moves on, mm-hmm. which is actually what we do when somebody else passes away who is not part of our inner circle, because we just continue with our lives. We don't know what happened and neither do they. So I think when we start looking at this more as a part of life, a normal part of life, then yes, it's going to be hurtful. And yes, there's going to be, and yes, there's sadness. But I think what was interesting when you, you were referring before those three little words, let it go. And I've been playing with them for so long in a sense, but what does it mean? Yeah. I mean, when somebody passes away and you feel the loss and you feel the sadness and somebody will say, ah, you will grow over it. No, you don't. Yeah. It will find a place. You won't grow over it. Yeah. And I think people say that because they don't know what else to say and it makes them really uncomfortable. So they're like, oh, it'll be fine. You know, people don't know what to say. So this makes me think you said inner circle and I, and I think you've lost a parent or both parents. Is that correct? Yep. No, one parent. My mom is still here, luckily. (laughs) Okay. And I don't know who else you've lost to death in your life, but how is losing your friend from when you were four years old different than losing a family member? Yeah, I think they're both, they're both surrounded with a lot of sadness, but there's a big difference between losing somebody where you, well, going back to what I said about my childhood, I mean, he made me feel I belonged. He was there. I mean, he had these massive shoulders that if he needed a hug, he was there. And I'm not saying my parents weren't careful. They were there. I mean, the same thing, but it's different. And you start sharing specific moments. You start sharing the birth of your children and all of these things. I mean, if I was driving to work, wherever I was, I would pick up my phone and start calling him and say, hey, where are you right now? What are you doing? And we just had those spur of the moment conversations about nothing and then about everything. And that all of a sudden is gone. The place where you could just go to and have your cup of coffee all of a sudden is gone. The person who you would call and just say, man, this just happened. I mean, right? And just, just get it off your chest. I mean, all of that is gone. And yes, there's others with whom you have that as well, and with you, you can build it up, but it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and you chose each other, right? You chose to be yep. best friends with each other. Yep. That definitely made me tear up when I <laughs> imagine losing my best friends. I don't even want to think about it. I feel like oh. it would be too devastating. And I've lost quite a few people in my life, but never a best friend. I'm going to knock on wood. Yeah. Okay. I have one or two more questions. No, I think I'll just ask this one. Is there anything I haven't asked that I should, (laughs) that you would like to share? No, I don't think specifically to this case or to this situation, I should say. I think what's interesting, and this is really where we started having our conversation just before, what I realized is this is about life. This is life. Mm. And for whatever reason, many people or we used to, we learned, we conditioned, whatever you want to call it, to look at this as something awful, to look at this as something that shouldn't happen, to look at this as something, whoa, look at what happened to me. Instead of understanding that it happens to all of us at a certain point in time. Absolutely. And I think if we, if we would just understand that, then it would be so much easier. There's been this radio commercial going on in the Netherlands recently about talking about death and there's somebody who calls in somebody calls into work and says, listen i can't come to work tomorrow because somebody passed away the other person says oh uh, sorry to hear that close family member no no my uh, my closest friend oh okay i'm glad it wasn't a family member then so i hope to see you again next week at work and you're like it's discounting this intense friendship you have with a person that may be stronger than anyone in your family right yeah 
And I think, and that's the real thing, I guess, that, and this is also what I like so much about the whole idea of defining moments. People need to talk about them more. People need to understand that they are a part of life quite often. And you're not the only one having them. We all and every human being right. has them in any way, shape or form. The great ones, the, the nice ones, but also the the sad ones, the ones with grief, the ones with regrets or whatever it is. Yeah. And if we, and this, this, this is one of the things that really hit me about a year and a half, two years ago, where I was thinking nobody taught me, not in school and not necessarily my parents, about grief or how to handle those moments in life. Right. Pick yourself and up th- and brush yourself off and get on with it was, I think our generation grew up a lot with, with from our parents. Yeah. 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 And I think that, and this is important to me, I mean, just the whole thought of it. I mean, men don't show their tears, men don't cry, yeah. be tough, be strong. Well, hang on. We have them as well. And we have those feelings as well. But what would happen if we would be able to teach children, teach the youth in general, but specifically at certain ages, this is what life is all about. I mean, these things will happen. Just be aware of them, and but also be aware that you can handle them. I mean, life isn't over right. when something like this happens. It's tough for a while, and it may take a while to let it go, but it will continue. Is that what you just said about, yes, this is going to happen, and it'd be great if we could teach our children more about mm-hmm. what happens in life and it will pass or you're going to be okay or whatever it might be. Is that what you might share with folks who have recently lost somebody or what would you tell people about this experience and how it has helped you or shaped you or sent you in a different direction that you would not have guessed? Yeah, I think the key thing is that there is no, no expiration date on this, on grief. Mm-hmm. There, there is no... It will take a year, three months or whatever. I mean, it's there. And one person needs a month and the other one needs a year and the next person needs 10 years. And I don't think what what I said before, I don't think we grow over it. I think we grow, which means that as we grow, it becomes relatively smaller, but it's never gone. That's pretty profound, my friend. (laughs) We don't grow over it. We grow. No, we grow. We grow and at a certain point you, well, you, we all have our life phases. And what I said before, when you can accept that this will happen and then you can talk about ages, of course, he died when he was 35. My mm-hmm. grandfather passed away at 92. My own father passed away at 75. But none of that compares to the other thing that Peter had to go through, which is seeing his daughter pass away at six months. Oh my goodness. So, you know, this whole uh... thing about too young to pass away. Yeah, that's true. But it's true for everybody. That could right. be as true for an 83-year-old or a 90-year-old as it would be for a 35-year-old or six months old. Right. right. So there is, there, is, there is no age, which is the right age to go. But also think there's, as I said before, there is no expiration dates for the people who are left behind. And I think the other thing that hit me, but not necessarily when Peter passed away, but when the family member passed away three years ago now, we always look at this from what we miss from our perspective. Right. But what when we flipped it around? Think about everything they will be missing out on. That's another, you could go bananas thinking about that. That's another yep. rabbit hole that, yeah. Yep, yep. That's but it's not, interesting to switch to perspective. It is, and I find that more painful sometimes. Like, oh my gosh, all these things that that person is missing. Yeah. You know, oh. But even when that would be more painful, I think it also helps to put our pain into perspective because then we realize it's not just all about us and what we experience right now. Right. It's also about them and what they will no longer be experiencing. Yeah. It's our defining moments. Yeah. Not yours, not mine, ours. Yeah. So, yeah, on a question I have, and I think it's a pretty universal question is, did Peter's death mean anything? What does it mean? What meaning do you give to it? That's a big question, isn't it? I mean, that's really the question. If, if, if this is a defining moment, either what, what does it mean or what do we learn from it? What do we take away from it? How do we make it significant? Or how is it significant for us? What it did for me is to see that he was, of course, working, playing for his dream. He was trying to, to get that store open. So I realized that life could literally be over in a split second. So we were both fairly young, 35. Mm. And here he is, has a family, uh, starts a business, and all of a sudden it's over and done with. So it did make me think about 
the amount of work I was doing, it did make me think about the amount of time I had to spend or had to use with my loved ones, with the people around me, family, friends, etc. And then one day I just did the math and said, listen, this doesn't make any sense because if I start working more than a certain amount of hours or a certain amount of days with the taxation we have in the Netherlands, mm-hmm. at a certain point, any number I would make for an extra day of work, I would have to pay 60% or something like that in Texas. So I was like, this, this doesn't make any sense. Why don't we live life more? instead of focusing all of our time on working and making the money. So I'm not sure if that's the meaning I got out of it, but that's at least something I've learned from it or something that it, it pushed me to, made me aware of, I think that's the right word, made me aware to think about and say, hey, <laughs> if it can be over in a split second, did you, did you really get out of it what you want to get out of it? I mean, are you yeah. really living the life you want to live? And, and do you think that you would be living your life as fully if Peter were still alive? If that moment didn't happen and you didn't have the, wow, wait, what am I doing here? I don't know. I don't know. And I think that's, that's the interesting thing about these questions. That's the, of course, what we talked about before in our conversation, all of those what ifs, and you can go anywhere with that. I don't know, because I don't know what, if this wouldn't have happened, what defining moment would have happened and how would that have influenced me? Because as we said before, there's so many of them. Well, Jan... I am so utterly thankful that you were here today and that you shared this defining moment. I know you've thought a lot about it over the years and, and you've thought a lot about many of your defining moments. And I just, I so appreciate you being really thoughtful about this. And yeah, and I hope, I hope to interview you again in the future. Let's do that. Looking forward to, uh, to do that. <laughs> Great. I'm so glad. Okay. Thank you so much. And this has been our defining moments. This has been Our Defining Moments with Mary McClements. I'm back next week with more stories of moments in time that change someone's life forever. Please rate and review the show and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a defining moment and want to share, head over to the Our Defining Moment website at ourdefiningmoments.com and click on Share a Moment. I'm always interested in people's stories and I may feature you on the podcast. 